All right, hello and welcome to a cybereducation.com information session and also a 610 ESPN Sunday School Show episode where it's our goal to inform the Sunday School Show is an educational show, but that doesn't mean we're only talking about educational issues. It doesn't mean we're only talking about school and school-based issues. It means we are education. We're educating. We're the school and we're here to learn, but today we do happen to be talking about educational issues and we're learning and talking about the same thing that the rest of the world really is talking about, and that's making the transition to the new normal of education, which appears, at least for now, to be cyber education. And we're joined today by a parent who's also an educator for over 20 years, 40 years, I think she said, we'll find out for sure. And we're also uh, joined by an education administrator who works on the logistics and business development side of school. So our first guest is Julie Bogart. Julie is a world-renowned homeschooling pioneer, and she's offering her classes free to parents currently until the end of April. For those who found themselves with suddenly at homeschoolers, right? So for, for some or for most homeschooling is probably a decision that they, uh, they make with a lot of thought and consideration and care. But now for the rest of the world, it's something that they're just suddenly thrown into. So we have to figure it out. Julie owns and operates BraveWriter.com, an educational site that she will tell us more about, as well as the popular fast-growing practice called Poetry Tea Time. She home educated her five children for 17 years, so she knows firsthand what it takes to educate children at home. Julie draws from her work with tens of thousands of homeschool families over the last 20 plus years and her own homeschool journey to enrich the homeschool and parenting experience. Hey, Julie, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me here. When I saw ESPN in the uh, call letters, I, my heart fluttered. I'm a huge sports fan. So this okay, is fun cool. for me. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, let's start with that then, right? Because um, it's something I wanted to talk about, but we'll just get right in there. So you're a, a huge sports fan. And I know one of the maybe criticisms of homeschooling is um, the lack of socialization or sports mm. opportunities. So how do you, what's your answer to that? What I've noticed is that homeschool families are often quite active in sports and sometimes sports drive families to become home educators. So if they join a select soccer team or they become a gymnast or they get really into cheer, the travel and competitions are more easily accommodated when they have a home education to support it. But even for families who aren't in elite sports, what they do is they join recreational leagues. They are always wanting to get out of the house. In fact, um, one of the things we keep saying during this pandemic is that this isn't normal homeschooling either, right? This is crisis schooling. No one is used to just being in the house all the time without their outside activities. Uh, I was a part of a co-op, for example, in Cincinnati that had 100 families in it, over 300 kids. And we did, we met every Monday and we did everything from Taekwondo to photography to algebra. So there's a lot of possibilities today now that homeschooling is so universal. No, that's a, that's a good point. And I, now that you mentioned, I do know a family in particular whose uh, son is, a, you know, his tennis is his passion and it was right. since a very early age. So they chose a cyber education route so that he could focus on tennis more or less full time and then also get the education necessary. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, what have you seen as the biggest concerns from parents at this point? So here we are, you know, a month or so into this, into this, uh, into all these families being thrown right into homeschool. What, what concerns are you hearing? It's really interesting. The questions that I got a month ago were about logistics. You know, how do we coordinate working from home for the first time with learning at home and using Zoom for classes? So that was the beginning. And my advice at the beginning is always to recognize that it takes time to make such a big adjustment. Home is not school. School is a completely different environment. It is designed to herd a large number of children through a set curriculum. And the teacher has the full authority. You know, you need a hall pass just to pee, right? You, you can't leave the room. You're not gonna get up and get a snack. Maybe there are couches, but you're not really free to just go sit on them whenever you want. The teacher has a certain method, a certain system, a certain performance. And the students know that and they cooperate with it beautifully in the school setting. But then you bring them into the home. And the home is a completely different set of criteria for being. You know, we wanna just be ourselves. 
We'll go stand in front of the refrigerator for 10 minutes trying to decide what to eat. We get up and use the bathroom whenever we want. We throw ourselves on the couch. And then a parent says, no, no, you have to sit at a desk or sit at the table and get this done. And there's this interior rebellion that comes out of children. It's like they know intuitively this is the place they get to be themselves. They don't want those restrictions. So the first piece of advice I give everyone is use the unique properties of home, the magic of home, to support the academics. And what does that look like? Well, maybe you're on your Zoom call and your child is feeling frustrated and distracted. So you give them a little bowl of peanuts to snack on. So they have something to do with their hands while they're staring at the screen. Maybe your child has a writing assignment. Well, can you get out a clipboard, tuck them into the corner of the sectional, let them pet the cat and do it on a clipboard? Could you turn on music and let them wear their headphones so that they have a feeling of ejecting themselves from the chaos of the dog and the toddlers and the baby, and they can sort of tune into their own world. Home can support the academics when we indulge it more than when we defy it. So uh, you personally, and for people who maybe have the option or the luxury of like kind of sectioning off areas of their home just for education, do you do that or recommend that? Or, or like you said, you think the whole house should be a part of the learning environment? So interestingly, homeschoolers universally, the ones who choose to be homeschoolers, almost always start with a homeschool room and a desk. And within a month, it's a homeschool house. <laughs> because children just can't be contained that easily in the place they call home. Not only that, the home offers you lots of opportunities. You might have two kids up in the master bedroom watching Sesame Street so you can give two older kids personalized attention during math. And then you swap. You put the older two kids upstairs where they watch what they wanna watch while you work with the younger two on phonics. So the house affords you opportunities. Um, and you asked about, well, so now we're a month in. Now's the time to mix it up a little bit. Everyone's starting to feel stir crazy. They're starting to feel like, oh no, I am gonna live this way forever. I have to always start at nine in the morning with math. Maybe do math in the afternoon. Maybe save it for the weekend. Maybe get outside in your backyard and do the problems orally, throwing a Frisbee or a lacrosse stick. You know, maybe you play horse and each time you shoot a basket, you think to yourself, okay, I'm gonna make this really hard basket and if they make it, they get three points and then they make it. And you, you make up your own rules, but you are practicing math at the same time. Or you play endless board games. Give yourself permission to use your body, to use entertainment, to use sports, to use physical activity, to help your kids stay engaged. Because let me tell you, school had more activity than most of us are getting at home right now. Yeah, that's true. That's a cool idea, gamifying uh, the learning process and, right. and making it fun and engaging. And I think if I'm correct on your website on Brave Writer, parents can get some ideas on different games or different activities they can play to help make it a little more fun, make learning a little more fun. Absolutely. So bravewriter.com slash homebound has a whole bunch of activities that you can download, some webinars to watch about this environment. We also did a week long conference where we taught about how to do math at home, how to do writing at home. So if you go there, you will see all that stuff. It's free for anyone who is interested in more ideas. Okay, perfect. Yeah, because in, you know, in the ideal world and, and probably honestly in, in the homeschooling world that you were in and that you brought your kids up in, you had a lot of options, right? Like you could go we to the museums or you could go to the mall and turn that into a lesson or you could go to a, a like exotic supermarket and turn that into a lesson. But right now, what kind of advice would you give to parents who like really their backyard might be the extent of where they can go? Truly. So there are a few things. Um, we've watched parents do some amazing things. Like let's say you're reading a book historical fiction, something that you can download on Kindle. Maybe you can't shop for it. Maybe you can. Um, you can take that book and turn it into a full investigation. So let's say it features ancient Egypt. Well, maybe then do your Google sort of treasure hunt of looking for foods that you can approximate, looking for experiments that you can do. I know with my kids, uh, we loved this practice that I created called Poetry Tea Time. So I would ask them to set the table. We'd get out my mother's china. We would make muffins. We would, you could do this in the backyard as a picnic as the weather gets warmer as well. And then I would just stack the table with poetry books 
And all we would do is read to each other while we sipped tea and we ate muffins. But even today, my kids are all adults now. That is still a core practice in their lives is to have tea time, to read, to experience literature together. Because what we're doing is we're pairing something that they love, the party atmosphere, with education we value. So yes, I would say that at this time, taking advantage of the outdoors is good, looking for experiments, traveling through YouTube to different parts of the world. One of our uh, families in my community showed us how they were doing a deep dive into each country by the order of coronavirus cases. So then they would just oh, cool. do recipes and cook and look at that country in a little bit more depth. Yeah, so that's interesting that um, your kids uh, remember your tea time so fondly. Oh. And I think really as, as unfortunate and sad and, you know, the deaths and the economic problems that are coming from this, it seems like kids are pretty, you know, those that are well protected are kind of actually enjoying this. And I think there's a lot of kids saying, like, I love being home with my parents or whoever they're home with, and they get to spend the days with them and they get to still learn, but they get to do it with their family. So I think, you know, I know personally being uh, involved in education and education law, um, it's, you know, few and far between parents who choose homeschool as an option. And generally, in my experience, and yours may be different, it's uh, parents who really are just so frustrated with the school system. They're mm. like, this is just my best option right now. It's not necessarily because they want to do it. I think a lot of families feel forced into homeschooling because they just kind of don't want to deal with their public school anymore. And maybe they can't afford private school. At least that's what I've seen. But I think now we might find parents who say, you know what, like, this is actually pretty cool. I can handle it. And I like having my kids home with me. And cyber education is, is pretty interesting. So when you, um, when you homeschooled and before everything you know, that's going on right now, did you use digital platforms to assist you? Or was everything kind of done with you know, uh, workbooks and textbooks? So the internet became available to us in the 90s. And my oldest child at the time was like fourth grade. So we had the internet. Um, but, you know, a little feather in my own cap, I'm... As far as I know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to being corrected, but as far as I know, we were the earliest company to use cyber learning for teaching. And honestly, I started in January of 2000. I did my beta class in 1999 and we used email groups. Do you remember e-groups? <laughs> so yeah. we didn't even use a website or a big platform. But what I discovered really early on and what continues to this day in Brave Writer is that there is a complete renaissance of writing because of the internet. More children today and more adults are writing than in the history of the world combined for a published audience. Like you put out a tweet, that's publication. That isn't just writing on a scratch piece of paper. So what we discovered is we could take advantage of this hunger to self-express and especially in a community context. And so we began with email and we've, you know, since developed our own platform. We don't use Blackboard or Canvas. We have our own uh, platform and we've educated tens of thousands of families that way. And here's what we've learned about cyber education, especially the way we do it. We're asynchronous. We allow parents and students to use the written word to grow. We don't do video because writing benefits from writing. So they are reading and then they are even expressing questions and comments in typing. And what ends up happening is their brain actually goes through a shift to where writing becomes self-expression and it's as natural as speaking. So what I love about cyber education is it's this opportunity for remote learning with experts in a field that can occur globally in a community that reads you. It's not just a teacher reading one lesson. You know, we, when we post our student assignments, everyone in the class can see them and they can read the teacher feedback on all 25 students. So there's this writing workshop atmosphere that gets created, which we find really academically powerful. Powerful. Interesting. So you mentioned um, asynchronous and I know the opposite of that is synchronous and maybe there's some families who don't know what that means, yeah. but I know those are important terms in, in cyber education. Can you please elaborate and explain? Yes, great. Um, asynchronous means you log in on your own schedule. So if you live in Taiwan, like one of our instructors does, she's going to log in during her eight to five day, even though here in the United States, our time zone is completely different. And what that means is you can submit work when you are at your peak 
uh, energetic power. You're not thinking, oh shoot, that class comes on at 7 p.m. and that's when I'm tired. You get to show up, log in and read when it's a good time for you. And then you're going to do the activity during the strength of your day. And then the instructor, wherever she lives, if she's in Taiwan, she's gonna get up and read it the next morning and leave feedback so that when you wake up, the feedback is there waiting for you. So in our community, we do have assignments with due dates, but you have the flexibility of when you access the assignment and when you post it. Thank you for that explanation. I know that's, uh, you know, when, when you look at the frequently asked questions for uh, cyber education and homeschool, that's one of them. And I think that's a difference that some people don't understand. So can you, I, I, two, two last things, and then I want to uh, yeah. speak with Daniel for a little bit, but hopefully you can hang on the call. Um, first, what about like when a parent needs a break during the day, right? Like, what, are, <laughs> what are your thoughts on letting uh, the iPad babysit for a little bit or, you know, getting into like YouTube wherever they want or Netflix? Um, what advice do you have for parents and kind of what are, what are your thoughts on um, kind of free range of the iPad? Yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of technology. And uh, my kids have heard me say thousands of times that the internet is the watershed event of my entire life. I believe in the tool. Of course, everyone worries about overuse. So here's how I see it. For parents who are working or parents who need time, and we all do, it's worthwhile to have your kids have something to look forward to. So rather than just sort of indiscriminate use at all times, plan in the morning with your kids. Okay, what do you wanna to watch today? Is it you know this series on Netflix? Is it the Harry Potter movies again? Is it the extended version of Lord of the Rings, my family's favorite? Okay, let's pick a time of day when that's going to happen. What do you need for it? Popcorn? Should we cut up the fruit? Should we get the blankets out? Like have them look forward to it. And then when three o'clock comes, guilt-free, go do the thing you need to do and your kids can give themselves that enjoyable time. A lot of times what happens is when there's sort of a free range and there's sort of this babysitting attitude like, okay, well just, I'm on the phone, just go do that. They actually get bored of screens. Screens are not endlessly entertaining. They are entertaining seasonally in the day. So what we're looking for isn't just indiscriminate use, but some targeted use. Now, there can be days, and my sons will tell you, their favorite days in memory are times when I said, okay, today, you guys can play all day, compete with each other, beat your levels, there's no end in sight. They loved those days, but they loved them because those were special days, not because that was the habit of the family. So that's how I see screens. And having a huge list of things they can do online is helpful. You know, certain YouTubes that you've vetted, science stuff they might not think to look up themselves. So do a little research and give them some options. So what I'm hearing then really, and that, and that leads into my next question, is that scheduling is important and saying if we get this and this and this done, at, you know, from this hour to this hour, part of the schedule is you get free time and here are your options for your free time. So with that, what does a typical day look like, at least for you? I think that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, anyone who's a fan of mine will know I'm not a huge fan of schedule, but I am a big fan of routine. Schedule to me is sort of at 9, we wake up, we start math at 9.30, we finish at 10.30, and you can become a bit of a slave to that and then very frustrated when your kids don't have the same energy level every day at 9.30. So we set up a routine kind of the way that we eat. So we wake up when we wake up, you know, if you have teenagers, let them sleep in. This is a rare moment in time where they can just sleep in. But once they're awake, have breakfast, start together, you know, do something like reading a book aloud or playing a board game or sitting together on the couch and just talking about what you want the day to be. And then maybe do some table time work where you're going to focus on those, um, you know, worksheets that you got from the school, or now's the time where you're dedicated to math and let everyone know, okay, we're all going to do this together and we're going to do it till we're done. And then we'll move on to going outside and kicking a soccer ball and getting our energy out. Then we'll return and do some writing. So when we did it in our house, we had kind of a rhythm that we established and we knew that the afternoon starting at around four is when they were going to be either watching a movie or playing a video game. But I did make use of those things earlier in the day. If I had, I had five kids, if I had to divide grade levels, like give some dedicated attention to two younger ones, the three older ones could go play Legos or something and vice versa. So think routine, 
more than schedule. Okay, perfect. And then sort of let our bodies uh, dictate as well. 100%. As as, yeah. And, and it varies day to day and parents forget this. Your child one day might be like, I don't want to do 20 math problems. I said to my kids frequently this question, how many problems do you have the energy and full concentration available for today? And you know what's wild? If you take them to heart, they say only one. And you say, great, let me see you do it. And you high five and you celebrate it. The next day they might say three. And what I discovered with my kids is over time, they would surprise themselves. They'd be like four problems in and they'd do five more. And then they'd be like, mom, I did nine. If we treat it like a taskmaster, now they have something to resist. So let them know you're their partner. Let them know that you believe in them and that you're going to support them. And for those of you who have you know, kids who've done sports, you know this. You know there are some practices where they're just totally dialed in and scoring right, left, and center and passing the ball well. And other days where they just aren't getting it. So you don't push them as hard. So you want to pay attention to that sort of undulation in their yeah. energy level. No, that's uh, great points. And I think that, you know, schools really just can't do that. And that's why we're not used to it. They really can't, you know, as much as they try to individualize, it's hard, but it just, it reminds me of personal training really, where if you have a good personal training on some days, they realize like, look, we worked out really hard yesterday and you pushed it. And today it's okay to listen to your body and chill a little bit. Yes. It's like marathon training. I'm a marathon runner. You know, you don't run a longer run every day. There are rest days. There's a day when you only go two miles and you build up to only one long run a week. So one of the math suggestions in our community is to create a marathon schedule where your kids know they're building up to this big goal, like I'm gonna do 50 problems on one day, but you build it up over time and they have days off and they have days where they only have to do three problems. And even if they wanna do more, you say, no, you need to rest your mind for tomorrow. You treat it like there's an end goal, not just a grade to achieve. And I think that's what school sometimes creates is this pressure to achieve instead of this accomplishment that is out there for them to suddenly realize. And that's, that's the opportunity of homeschool for sure. So in, in your world, though, is the end goal some ultimate evaluation or is it something else? And how are uh, the students evaluated? It's a great question. Evaluation is less a part of homeschool uh, because we're present. We actually know what our kids are doing. Grades were created to send a message from a teacher to a parent who wasn't there. And that became this whole mechanism of a system to tell everyone how someone's doing related to someone else. But if you're home, you know whether or not they got it. You know whether or not they're achieving. So we evaluate more as an observational process where we keep incrementally growing the challenge. And when we hit mastery, we stay there for a little while and then we lead it again. So it's not uncommon for a homeschool child's uh, story to be third grade reading, fifth grade math, second grade science, like that, you know, first grade spelling, like they might have a variety of levels that they're working at because that's just how a human being is. So I, but parents I, talk with each other a lot. So we have a good sense of what's going on for our kids. And, you know, fundamentally, I think that sounds nice, but what about when it's time to apply for college? How can a college understand that? And what about if they want to transition into a high school, maybe like maybe you want to uh, homeschool till ninth grade, how can a high school understand, you know, what you understand? Totally. So my experience with thousands of parents is that if you want your kids to go to high school, they will go to high school. The, the variation between kindergarten and eighth grade is the biggest variation you're going to have because some kids start reading later, some understand numbers later. But there is a popular research theory that says everything that you learn between first and sixth grade can be taught in junior high and they will get it because they're brain maturation. So the brain development by the time you start high school has usually compensated for any lack in the first six years of education and most kids are ready. Now I had multiple kids go to public high school and they were at varying levels. One of my kids was not really ready for math, but we put her in algebra one anyway. And within a semester, she was, she was getting an A. Why? Because she had been homeschooled, she knew how to teach herself. She knew how to have the discipline to go home and do the extra problems. So even when they're behind, sometimes their homeschooling experience ends up undergirding them in the new experience of school. 
They're also not bored of school by then, so they're kind of excited to try all the things. <laughs> all right, perfect. Thanks, Julie. So if you don't mind hanging on and, and we'll uh, speak with Daniel for Thank a little you. bit, and then I, you know, we'll circle back to you. Daniel Koffler is an education management professional since 2005. He's been involved in managing the admissions, facilities, and business management departments in various educational settings. Today, Daniel focuses on the continued expansion of new frontiers, nfil.net. We'll have a link to that at uh, cybereducation.com and in the show notes, and as well as to the Brave Writer, where his focus revolves around providing individualized support in the areas of executive functioning, coaching, and transition support. Daniel provides the overall strategic direction and short and long-term planning agenda while overseeing the financial, marketing, and business development aspects of the business of school. So, uh, hey, Daniel, welcome. How are you? Good morning. Good. Thanks for having me. Good. So, um, so what have you seen? What kind of changes? I know you have a, a team of experts working kind of around the clock to make that pivot to cyber education. What, what are your uh, biggest roadblocks right now? And what, what kind of changes have you made? So, you know, I have a couple different perspectives. Um, and listening to Julie was very interesting. Um, I am a parent as well of three young children. So we are in the midst of, uh, of homeschooling as well. By we, my wife is really running prime, a point on that. Um, our kids are young, so it's a bit of a different experience there. So I'm watching that and I'm seeing kind of what my kid's school is doing to kind of, it, with, with best intentions, attempt to kind of like lay a, a foundation for this work. Um, my wife's not a teacher. She's a, a talented person and she's making the most of it, but it's, it's a shift. Um, and it happened in a really short amount of time, which I yes. think didn't give a lot of folks, schools included, maybe schools especially, time to prepare for that. And you know, our work revolves around those kids who, generally those kids who fall through the gaps, um, the kids where a traditional learning environment isn't going to be what, 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 what moves the needle in terms of like really kind of attending to their unconventional learning styles. So we're, for the students we worked with before kind of the current reality settled in, um, many of them have, have doubled up or kind of increased the amount of time they're spending with us because they realize that this, this transition is, is a significant one. We're missing about a semester of school or, or, a, or a more meaningful part of it. Um, and that has to get made up somehow, but it also can't be made up time-wise. Um, to Julie's point you know, earlier, school has a built-in accountability to it. Like you're physically having to go somewhere. My kids wear uniforms to school. So like there's a certain expectation of how you present yourself there that is very difficult to, to, to recreate at home after a weekend, essentially. Like one weekend we weren't doing this, one weekend we were. Um, so I feel for all the parents who are, who are, who are attempting to do this, our coaches uh, and our support team are working on a couple different levels to just provide support, if you will. We have a parent seminar every week. We have a professional seminar every week. We do PD with our staff every week um, just to keep them engaged and keep them comfortable because the, even for the folks who do this on a day-to-day -day basis, like our staff, we've been working virtually with our students for, for years now, virtually and in person, but we had about half our population working virtually. So we're comfortable with the platforms and the approach, um, but it's not for everybody. It's not designed for everybody necessarily. So even folks who, who wouldn't have otherwise gone into a, a, an academic experience like this, they have no choice now. So it's, um, we're all learning as we go, frankly. Um, but but I, I, I think that um, it's getting easier every day. I think that, you know, to, to Julie's point earlier, you know, it's, it's not fair to have an expectation of every single day must be like, necessarily like meaningful progress. Like you can, like even I, even us, we're adults and we have to take a day and take a step back sometimes. Um, so I think that's an important piece for people to understand that's it's not, it's not quitting. It's actually kind of giving your chance, yourself a chance to kind of refresh. And that, as a coach, like as coaches, that's a really important concept for us. Yeah, I agree. And I think that a big part of moving forward was when, you know, I think schools finally announced that this is permanent, right? When it was like a week, two weeks, a month, we didn't really settle in. But I think now that we know that it's permanent, we can kind of settle in and then we can adjust and we can actually take the steps moving forward. Daniel, can you tell us a little bit about what New Frontiers does and what executive function coaching is? And also, you know, I heard you say meaningful progress, which is really like a special education term. And if both of you can kind of weigh into the difficulties and the unique needs of children with disabilities and how we can program for them during these times. Yeah. So the, the, the earliest background is my family has been involved in building and operating private schools in and around New York uh, for, for three decades or so at every different level. So early childhood, K-12, general ed, special ed, funded, private pay. So we and then kind of cross-pollinating those different, those different approaches. So 
we've seen quite a bit. Um, we built and owned and operated for a number of years a school called the Aaron School, which is in Manhattan. Um, it's for, it's a, a wide range of, of unconventional learners attend a program like that, but predominantly those with learning differences and mental health challenges, you know, mild to significant instances, some students on the spectrum. New Frontiers grew out of that program because families were asking us when, around the first time that the first 10th grade class was approaching 10th grade, we grew that school from an elementary school through middle and high school. So as we were growing it out, um, families started approaching us and saying, listen, we, we appreciate the supports that are built into this program. This is, uh, it is, it's not a large part, a meaningful part of the progress that kids are making. We're concerned about what happens when they transition to college. And all these supports are no longer necessarily part of the equation. Um, and by that, I mean a couple different levels. You have the academic piece, like just like in your face, um, you know, teachers teaching you as compared to professors who are not necessarily teachers. Um, and so like that, that interpersonal dynamic is different. Um, the self-advocacy required to go seek your professor out and go get a better handle on, well, what do you mean I have 10 weeks to accomplish this assignment and, you know, no real kind of guidelines on how to do that. That, that requires self-advocacy and problem-solving skills that, that not a lot of, not, not every student develops and perfects before they get to college. Then you have the fact that they're turning 18. So now they are legally responsible for themselves, right? And they might not understand like the full capacity of that responsibility. Um, and then, you know, uh, less, less than a support, but it's a reality. They're not living at home anymore. So no one's making their bed, no one's doing their laundry, no one's making them food. You know, these are life skills that are critical to being a self-sufficient independent member of society, but they're things that we don't necessarily focus on until we're no longer uh, having the support kind of provided for us. Most of us are able to kind of just, you know, walk into the wall and realize, oh, like that's a wall. We can't walk through that. And you kind of walk around it or you climb over it. You figure out a, a, an approach that will allow you to kind of continue moving forward. There's a, a meaningful component of the population who doesn't have those skills or isn't able to develop those skills on their own, despite society's expectation that that's what happens when you turn a certain age or hit a certain kind of transitionary milestone. I know, you know, in, in a lot of students, sometimes their 18th year, their senior year, but for students with more profound disabilities, their 21st year is a, is a huge year for uh, learning those transition skills and learning those life skills. And they're kind of being robbed of it, you know, like these last few months of school, you know, while I think schools really should start programming for transition stuff when kids are, you know, 12 or so. Um, for a lot of schools, I think it's these last few months uh, and, and that last year when they're really kicking it into high gear. So what advice can you give to any families who may have a child and specifically a child with special needs graduating during this time or um, aging out? Well, uh, you know, I may be biased, but I think a coach could be a really useful support. Um, you know, I think a lot of parents feel as if it is their responsibility solely to kind of help their, their sons and daughters master these skills. And everyone's heard the concept of it takes a village. Parents are in a very unique position, regardless of circumstances of their children, like being a parent is a very challenging job to have. And it's constantly shifting. As soon as you get comfortable, the, the, the needs change and you have to kind of like develop a, a new sense of understanding of how to work with that. So don't be ashamed in, in acknowledging that you don't have all the tools and all the answers. I, I don't think it's a fair expectation for parents to have that they should be able to solve every single problem that comes their way. Um, because it does get complicated. And in addition to that, the, the emotional component, the emotional connection can really um, wreak havoc on a relationship. In particular, as kids, I, I, you know, we start focusing on the sports we provide in middle school. So that's when transitions really begin to kick in. Um, but in high school, I mean, these, these, these kids, these, these young men and women are really pretty so aware of their place in the social pecking order at that stage. And, you know, one of the things that comes with that adolescence is like a, and almost, you know, unquenchable ability to say, no, mom and dad, like I hear what you're saying, it makes perfect sense in their head, but I'm not gonna listen to it. Just I'm gonna do the, I, I wanna just see for myself how this, how this operates. You know, so sometimes like you might just run at the end of your course or for a period of time at least, you know, children will, will be kind of pretty rebellious to a certain point and come back and be, you know, fall into the exact same things that they were not listening to, but they were kind of absorbing all those years and become their parents um, in many cases. So I think it, there's nothing to be ashamed about to, to seek support. Um, be it from a coach or a friend or uh, um, a school administrator or, or anybody who might, who might be able to kind of provide some different perspective. Nothing wrong with that. I think it's actually very healthy. The same way that, you know, the, the greatest 
amongst us in society, the best athletes, the best politicians, the most well-known professionals, they don't do it by themselves. You know, they, they do a lot, don't get me wrong, but they have somebody helping them dribble with their right hand, dribble with their left hand. It's not in spite of, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, in, it's not in spite of their coaches that they've reached this level of success. Do you accept compensatory education for payment for your services, Daniel? We do, we do, we do quite a bit of that. Um, we, we currently operate, we're, we're, we, we're, we're based in New York, so we, were, we kind of organized ourselves in the tri-state area, New York City in particular, which has its own you know, set of you know, special, specialties in terms of how you negotiate that process. But we operate um, in Philly, DC, South Florida, um, and in all those areas, um, we do, yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Because one thing, you know, we're recommending to parents who we might have gotten some comp ed for is spend that spend that comp ed money because you can get professionals that maybe you couldn't afford otherwise. And then hopefully when this is all said and done, we get to the other side of it for any services that were missed during this time. If the laws don't change as the laws stand right now, parents should be able to get some comp ed for this time where they were denied any services. Most definitely. Yeah. yeah. And what about you, Julie? Do you accept comp ed at all for any of the tutoring services? I'm not familiar with that. We do take charter school funds. I'm interested in that. We have a large population of homeschooled kids who have learning challenges, executive yeah. function issues. So yeah, I'm interested in that. Cool. Yeah. So compensatory education just briefly is like a fund of money that students can get um, from a school if, if it's determined that they were deprived of some educational benefit. And they try to say like, maybe you were deprived of 100 hours of speech in a school year. So here's 100 hours that you can use for really anything to further your IEP goals. So um, definitely something useful. Um, what do you guys think? I just I don't know if you saw Trump's address a, a night or two ago, but um, so phase one, you know, they're opening gyms and some other things and then schools aren't opening until a phase two. Do either of you have any input or ideas why schools would be, you know, one of the last places to open? I mean, my, my take is that it's certainly, a, you know, a large gathering and, you know, in relatively tight, tight confines. Outside of my work with New Frontiers, I've also, you know, we've been in the school business. We have a daycare center, a preschool. Um, and so we're thinking about this very actively. Um, and I think the truth of the matter is it's not necessarily what the administration says or the local government says or what I say. It's going to be when people feel comfortable. And I just keep wondering who's going to be the first person to, uh, you know, hop on the subway, drop their kid at school, and then go, you know, back to work for a full day and go to a nice dinner afterwards. I, and I'll, that, that said, I have this conversation with my friends every single day. Um, there's some who, are, who cannot wait because they're just cooped up or because their work allows them to kind of have minimal interaction with people. Um, but from a from the school perspective, I, I don't think that the schools are in the driver's seat. I think it took a long time to kind of push people to kind of listen to like, the stay at home orders. Um, it happened relatively quickly, but I, considering it still took some time, I think it's gonna take a longer time to get people to kind of come out of that. That said, there are absolutely people out there and, and we work with a lot of them in our schools who need this. It's, it's not a want issue, it's a need issue. And we, we are here to provide that, that need. Um, and we welcome them and we'll do it. We will, you know, we, in our case, we'll do everything we can to make, to maintain, you know, the cleanest, healthiest, safest environment. Um, but it's going to be up to the people as it is with any private enterprise at any point in time, you know, pandemic or not. So what are your, what are your predictions? Jill? Do you think we'll be back to uh, the old normal by fall or do you think this is going to continue on for a little bit? It's interesting. You know, I'm, uh, the pulse I'm getting from the new people, we had a huge surge in a new audience. We're one of the few businesses that's growing during the pandemic. And the, what we're hearing from those families are two things. One is they're afraid to go back to the school. So even if they open, they're asking, can we keep just taking classes with you, use your program, and then we'll redecide in the fall. And then there's a second tier of people who've always been homeschool curious, you know, and this gave them like an opportunity they never saw coming and now they want to keep going. So we're anticipating an influx of homeschoolers who came through this period and suddenly realized this was an option at least for the coming foreseeable future, it may not be long term. Now that's anecdotal. I didn't do the numbers before I got on the show, but I think our um, new customer rate increased by something like 40%. So that was really fascinating to us. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, how are people finding out about you? Well, word of mouth is the number one method for homeschoolers. But I've also been on just a surprising number of radio shows. I've probably done 18 in the last week and a half. I've been on television. I was in the New York Times, Bloomberg, uh, Gu Guidepost. 
I have a book out. It's called The Brave Learner, published by Penguin Random House, uh, Tartra Perigee. And that book came out literally a year ago, and it's going through a resurgence right now of interest. So I think, you know, we, I, I kind of joked on the first radio show I was on, I feel like I was born for this moment. I've been living off stage, like for all these years, doing this weird thing everybody was suspicious and skeptical of with a large group of people, but always alone. And now suddenly we're like center stage and homeschoolers have been around for about 50 years. And we have a contribution to make to the story of education. We have insights that we've gleaned because of this sort of personal tutorial model. Everything you said, Daniel, about executive function and coaching, is so much easier to facilitate at home. My oldest son has ADHD and I was able to accommodate him throughout his education. He was homeschooled all the way through high school. He quit college twice or three times. And today he's a self-taught computer programmer making more money than the rest of us, right? So, you know, over time he learned, but it took him till he was about 28 to get there. And we know that now. Um, I have a fourth child who's a boy and we did four years of junior high because I knew he wasn't ready for high school. And then he took a gap year and ended up in a great books program, totally hardcore school program at St. John's College, despite having been this very non-traditional learner. So homeschooling for some families is suddenly like the lights going on, like, oh, my unusual child can thrive in this context. And that's nice for them. I love what you're doing, Daniel. Everything you said, I'm like, yes, that sounds just like what we believe in. That's cool. Julie, for your child with uh, ADHD, did you ever have to bring in other experts or consultants or were you able to figure it out? So I had him tested multiple times in his childhood and he kept coming out negative, which was really interesting. We did consult with a therapist for about two years and she basically said, I don't think he has ADD or ADHD, but if you use these strategies, they will work for him, so we did. Then he went to college and took the test and suddenly he qualified. Well, here's why. The tests are about your performance in school. So they say things like, how's hard time turning in homework? You know, is chaotic? Well, he was accommodated thoroughly at home. So he didn't answer any of those questions in the way that would make it show up. And I find that interesting. So there, there are no tests that are normed for homeschooling? Not that we know of yet. For ADAP. Well, there should and, be. That seems like an obvious starting point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert. There may be, but we did not run into them when we were on that search. Yeah, so, in, for like behavior scales and other right. parent input forms, you would need uh, something specific. It seems like it because so much of it was around this um, inability to perform in a system. We didn't have a system. You know, he wasn't ever yeah. late with anything. <laughs> you know, he could find his math work, it was in the living room, right? So speaking of that, have either of you had experience yet with uh, any children, uh, you know, needing any kind of uh, virtual evaluations at this point, whether it's for initial eligibility for uh, special education or maybe, you know, a speech evaluation or any other kind of evaluation uh, at this time? Yeah, so I mean, we, we, start, we, don't, we don't evaluate, we, we digest the contents of evaluation, certainly. Um, so, but I work with a lot of mental health professionals, a lot of neuropsychologists, a lot of, you know, ed evaluators, um, people who are going to be you know, the first stop on the train towards accommodations in college or in high school. Um, and they are struggling, it, it feels like to me, from the, and this is, this is anecdotal as well, I've spoken to a couple, um, but it seems, I think people are a bit reluctant to attempt to do this kind of a process that can take three days in person um, virtually. I think there's just, there's some, some, I think some feel that there's too wide of a gap between this, this, this dynamic um, to do it productively. Um, I've met plenty of folks who are finishing, who are taking this time to finish up reports. You know, they have like stacks of reports in their desk that now you can finally catch up on them, but the well is running dry, it feels like. Th that said, with every day that goes by, I'm hearing more guidance from state ed departments and things like this that are saying, look, in this circumstance with this particular thing and that thing, you can do this productively and we'll, and we'll bless it, we'll accept that. Um, but I think that the professionals are still having a bit of a challenge doing that because they know what a good product looks like and they're concerned about providing a good product. Yeah, my, my take on it is that, um, you know, at first we were you know, kind of considered that school is going to start back again. So, uh, you know, an observation, for instance, would obviously be best completed in the school because that's the, the typical learning environment. But I think now that we've again decided that the learning environment is home, 
that observations really should be done in the home because that's what counts right now. So maybe if it's, you know, it's even like setting up a nest cam and observing from a distance silently, like in some ways I could see the evaluation process actually being easier for an evaluator because they can kind of just tune in and truly be uh, anonymous and not be seen by the students so as not to disrupt anything or have them act differently. And then from there they can kind of, you know, give input on how to best program for this child in this learning environment, because, you know, education has to be, if it, you know, if a child's in the hospital or if, you know, if some kids are young and incarcerated, they still have to receive their FAPE wherever they are. So I think if this is the least restrictive environment right now, because of our current circumstances, then I think, I personally think evaluation should be done in the home somehow. I don't know if either, have you seen it, Juliet, where anyone's done a tele-eval? I have not, but I will say this, um, the personality of the homeschool movement would probably not be excited about that. They have worried for decades about the idea of being evaluated in the home and that setting policy that would limit their rights to be homeschoolers. So, and in fact, I think there's some symposium that was just convened at Harvard uh, where they were talking about policy related to child abuse in homeschooling and they did not include a single homeschooling leader in that group. So one of the problems that I have seen over the decades with home education is there's a fiercely independent sort of mistrust of the government because we have wanted to prove that this alternate way of educating would still achieve similar results to institutional learning. And honestly, I'm a huge fan of public schools. Like personally, I feel like we need to support the levies. I always vote for them. I have kids who attended high school. It, it, it's been the massively successful project globally that has brought us to where we are in the 21st century. But home education itself always falls into a category of suspicion. So I'm picturing these home evaluations and these parents being like, I don't want you to see that I didn't clean up the dishes. I don't want you to judge that we did spelling on the couch and not at a table. I don't want you to call this sibling bickering that's going on something about my dysfunctional parenting. I think that would be the fear, um, just projecting, but that's my hunch. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I see that. I think what I'm talking about, though, is um, you're asking for it, right? So it's kind of voluntary where you say, because I guess we have to kind of like talk about the semantics that I, I think really what we're talking about um, with what, what we're calling it homeschool because they're, it's school at home, but it's really like home instruction. I think legally True. we have to call it home instruction. Whereas homeschool is really when you withdraw from the school district and you are now like creating that. the curriculum for your kid or following something. This is kind of home instruction, but I think what's best right now is to learn from people like you who've homeschooled because I think who knows better than you how to deliver instruction in the home. And, you know, we'll have parents who maybe their, their kids injured or sick and they know they're going to be home for a couple months and say, like, well, I want to homeschool them now. But that's not necessarily withdrawing them from the school district because you give up all your rights at that point. Right. And it's all on you. Yeah. So I think this is considering something that's home instruction that's modeled after somewhat homeschool program, like something like what you're doing. And then the parents saying like, we still want the school to provide us the curriculum and the guidance and any support my kid needs. So if my kid, I, I use speech as an example, because I think that's one that seems pretty easy to provide over Zoom or some other Skype yes. something. And I know kids have done that, you know, for a while, some things may be harder, like, you know, maybe some behavioral supports might be harder and possible to deliver virtually, you know, like you, a one to one assistant on your iPad doesn't probably do much for you to keep you focused. Um, Makes but sense. yeah, so I think, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it would be something mandatory for, especially if someone just says like, I don't want anything to do with my school district. I'm doing this on my own. But if there's a parent who um, wanted extra supports and services, they don't, their kids doing X, Y, or Z at home, they're not focusing and they want someone to observe and evaluate and maybe give them some kind of like behavior plan that they can use in the home. Is there anything, have you ever use something like that where you actually welcome the evaluation not not someone uh, evaluating you to to critique you as the teacher but evaluating the no, child I, to help give supports i think i got that um I, and i will say this uh there's a colleague of mine she runs a company called rooted in language she's an slp you know 40-year veteran she does a lot of webinar trainings for parents and so there's, uh, an, I mean, because we're global and, you know, not limited to one state, she's not doing official evaluations because she's not certified in every state, but she is able to give the kind of instruction that helps parents implement practices that you would get if you had personal help. Um, and I do know that school districts 
provide to homeschool families SLP support. My own son, my third child, he did speech at the local elementary school while he was a homeschooled child. So I know that there's a lot of that hybrid stuff. When I hear you say evaluating like just what they're doing with reading or something, yeah, that, that would make total sense to me that you could have a remote observation for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. But so far you haven't had experience with that with someone? No, no, only with this one company that I'm telling you about where she's providing it through her organization, kind of the way Daniel is, where it's, it's something you pay for. It's not provided through the schools. Yeah. Okay, cool. It's just something interesting to us because, you know, typically when, it, when a kid's home, you would say this isn't the time to evaluate. But if we're, if there's no end date, um, then, and we don't know when school, like, then this really is the kid's classroom. So I think if a parent now were to request an evaluation, you know, schools have 60 days or so to get that evaluation done that timelines start like stop in the summer if a kid's not in school. But I think now those timelines should be running because um, mm. this is the school day. I don't, in Philly, I, I think, you know, Philly, we had a problem with this digital divide. And I guess you've all been hearing about that a lot right now where there's just the gap between kids that have access to technology and kids that oh, don't yeah. much wider than we ever thought. So I think we're still trying to get technology and internet into the hands of kids here in Philly. Are you seeing that in New York, Daniel, or how are they handling that? Um, I mean, sure. Uh, I mean, the, the kids who we work with are generally okay. We're a private pay program, so most of the families we work with have the means to support, like, you know, for upfront and behind the scenes stuff. But even, even, even outside of, you know, having access to internet or, or uh, people who have all the resources, computers still break. Like, I'm not a computer technician. Like, my printer breaks and, like, my wife can't print off the documents. Like, there's still that kind of stuff that it doesn't get as much attention, nor does it necessarily deserve it. But it's a real thing. It still impacts the quality of learning. You have limited time in the course of the day to get everything ready. Um, there's still impacts that because you are not in an, a, a, a more organized school environment, or the least one that, that families, in, in, like in my family's example, are currently used to, um, it's just, there's just so much extra pressure. It just amps up the blood pressure at eight o'clock in the morning. It's the last thing you need. Um, yeah, and, and what do you do if you have four kids and just two computers in the family and their Zoom meetings are at the same time? How do you, it's like triage, you know, who's, whose class is more important? I've been hearing that from parents. So I know that's a challenge. And um, in fact, my kid's dad, he's a, um, an English teacher here in Cincinnati uh, in an inner city school. And out of his 120 students, he only has 25 that have computers at home with internet access out of 120 students. So what are I, they doing? Is, is he, I know in Philly for a minute, they were telling teachers don't do anything because we want to make sure like based on equality and equity, they're saying do nothing because then at least we know everyone gets the same, nothing. But now so I think they're saying just we, try. What, what I did, he called me. He's like, Julie, what do I do? I said, well, can they read books at least? He's like, yes. So I went and I rounded up like 60 or 80 books from Brave Writer and we sent them to him and he did this drive with his friends in 24 hours and had enough books for everyone to take home two or three books. And he said, if you read all the books, you'll get an A. Like that was his thing. And then for the 25 who are bored out of their minds at home, he meets with them and does a book club online and just talks about what they're reading and asks them questions. He's a very animated character. Um, but he's, he's worried about them. These are high school students you know, uh, seniors who aren't finishing school, aren't being prepared for whatever's next. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, when you brought that up, I was like, yeah, we have the same thing in Cincinnati. It's awful. I mean, yeah, so it makes me feel like the internet needs to be a public utility for heaven's sake. Like, I don't understand that. It's true. Even if only for, you know, school age kids. And then after yeah. that, like, you should, you can buy it. But yeah, I think uh, all kids should absolutely have access to the internet. Um, it's a problem. And I think that's why I think Philly said it. it's not really till the first week of May that they plan on actually delivering instruction. So right now everyone's kind of just at a, at a standstill. No one's really doing anything, unfortunately. That, that has its own problems. There's only so much atrophy you can do before you can just kind of turn that switch back on. Yeah. So that slide, those, the academic slide, any advice either of you can give to parents who, again, like they don't, maybe they don't have, um, they're not able to access either of your courses, anything a parent can do to kind of just keep their kid, at, you know, if not sharp, at least not rusty. Two things, play games and read. Read. Gaming yeah. is shockingly helpful. Um, whether it's board games, card games, dice games, 
there are so many levels of skill development going on when you're playing games. So gaming is a great way to sort of sustain sort of the math, the strategic, the cooperation, the reading, the following a sequence. It's, it, it's surprisingly helpful. And then reading is paramount. And if your kids can't read or you struggle to read aloud, audiobooks are absolutely fabulous. Start the audiobook habit at breakfast and lunch. Um, if the book has a movie version, read the book, watch the movie, have a big juicy conversation comparing and contrasting. Be normal, don't be weird, don't say who's the protagonist. Say things like, hey, who are we rooting for? Who are we rooting against? Why do we think that guy should lose? How come we know what needs to happen before this movie's over for it to resolve? How, how do we want it to resolve? How will we feel if it doesn't resolve that way? Like ask normal questions, but get them thinking and talking and making comparisons most education is through dialogue. So you have this opportune time to capitalize on that. Read, game, talk. Okay, cool. What about you, Daniel? What advice can you give? I love that. I would add, ask questions. I mean, I guess to your point, I would emphasize that. Because, you know, from our perspective, like the, the, a coaching model really is just about asking questions and kind of trying to understand from the mind of the, the individual who's, who's, who's receiving the coaching supports, how, how are you thinking about this? Like, how do we kind of help you through your way of looking at the world access this content? So asking questions is critical. Obviously, it doesn't do good to, to provide the answer. It's just, you know, and the answer, this doesn't have to be a right answer. It's just their answer. That gives you a foundation to work from to kind of debate, to, to determine, all right, like, where can we take this from here? Like, how, how, how apt are they with this, with this approach? And if not, then, you know, be comfortable changing approaches. And again, I, I just go back to Julie's point earlier. I think it was such an astute point about not every day has to be the, you know, uh, you know, climbing Mount Everest in terms of accomplishment, it, it won't be. And that's a not fair, it's not a fair expectation for parents to have of themselves, for them to have their children. Um, it will lead to uh, a, dis a disappointment, I think, on, on all parts. Um, and it's not necessary. It doesn't have to be that way. So just, there could be some days when like the exact same approach works and another next day, it just doesn't. And don't have to force that, especially under the circumstances we're in right now. You know, a lot of folks are talking about like, look, you know, one of the best parts of this experience is like to just be with your kids, which people don't always have a lot of time to do. And it can be difficult to do for some folks, but like embrace it because this is, this is in terms of how extraordinary the situation is, like that's one of the things that you're going to remember at the end of the day. It's not going to be, did they get that math question right on Thursday at two o'clock? It's going to be like, did I really have a meaningful connection? Which can lead to a much more positive outcomes in terms of learning and relationships in general. Yeah, I want to piggyback off your questions thing. Um, one of the practices my community does is something I call the great wall of questions. So you let your kids know that every question they're going to ask over the next 48 hours is going up on the sliding door on a post-it note or on the refrigerator, no matter what the question is. So they might ask, you know, how does coronavirus spread? But they also might ask, why does Johnny get the blue toothbrush and I'm stuck with the orange one? So every question goes on a post-it note and you don't answer it. You're like, that is good. And you write it down. Oh, that's a great one. They're like, but mom, I want to know. Oh, we'll talk about it. But I'm just going to put it here. and We're just going to let it sit. You can read them anytime. You can think about them anytime. Sometimes they start an overlapping chain because kids will see a question and ask a follow-up like, well, if it spreads to my neighborhood, then. So you put all these questions up and then for dinner, two days later, you just start peeling them off and reading them and let that stimulate the conversation at dinner. The goal isn't to be the Google search engine where you answer it instantly. It's to allow for this simmer of curiosity to grow in your children. And some of those will lead to rabbit trails that you can really exploit as a learner. All right, perfect. Julie, Daniel, thank you both uh, so much for joining us. Again, check Julie out at bravewriter.com and Daniel at nfil.net for new frontiers. There'll be link to that, links to those uh, websites in the show notes as well as on cybereducation.com. But again, yeah, thank you both so much and keep in touch. Okay, hope everything goes well for you guys and stay safe and healthy. Joseph, thanks so much. Julie, great meeting you. Take care. Good luck. Likewise, I'm writing you down. I love what you're doing. We'll connect offline, absolutely. Okay, thank All you. Right. Thank you Bye. so much, Joe. You're great. Take well. care. Bye. My Take pleasure. Care. See ya.